Broadcasting deep from the heart of Mordhouse, it's the only podcast discussing the world's most metal band. Get ready for Deathcast. And welcome back to the only podcast giving you exclusive behind-the-scene coverage of our world's history known as Metalocalypse, broadcasting deep from within the walls of Mordhouse. I'm your host, Clocketeer 616 with me, my partner in crime and fellow Clocketeer 47. How you doing today, bud? Man, I'm fine. I mean, like, you know, I'm I'm fine. Things are good. You good? I'm good. Oh. I mean, I was on vacation and shit. And yeah. Like, but, you know, it's I'm happy to be here. I really am. I'm glad. I'm glad you got a vacation as well. It's un- it's uncommon knowledge that once you l- reach a certain level of employment as a clocketeer, you're allowed about two months of paid leave. Oh yeah, which is pretty nice. Yeah, I used to the beach. Of it. I was just stuck here working. I didn't really have much to do. Mm-hmm. So, actually, uh, went to a couple shows, you know. But that's that's pretty much it. That's, that's normal shit, right? Yeah, I was recruiting. I had fun. I was on the beach and shit, man. I'm happy for you. I, I, you coloring on the beach. The hood kind of gives you a weird tan. Yeah, it's fun, you look really but, funny. You know, but not many people see you without it, so no one cares. Well, I'm glad you had a good time. I had fun. Um, we last left Death Clock in a very vulnerable position uh, on Deathcast and in the documentary. When we last left the boys, they'd been struck the finishing blow here at Mordhouse with the death of manager and CFO Charles Foster Oftenson. Uh, the documentary picked up about nine months after his fatal death, and Mordhouse had taken to the skies after the attack was obvious, you know. We had to bump things up for safety reasons, but also so the boys could renovate the property. Um, After the great battle, our home was left in shambles, and I was kind of happy to see our home take flight once more. Yeah, I mean, at least getting it up again was nice. It was really fucking annoying, because you would think, just because the gig stopped and the thing... No, nothing stops there, man. There's a constant train of... I mean, until the, the money went a little bit sideways, but... Yeah, it takes a lot to stop the gears. Getting things to the sky is fucking impossible. I'm I'm happy we could do it, even though we didn't have Charles at the time. Yeah, no, it was a good... I mean, just... It's a lot to deal with, you know, when you have to... When you're in the fucking sky. How do you... Go, you can't go anywhere, man. Yeah, yeah. it was kind of weird. We, we would kind of, like, float, but move at the same time. We lost a few guys because they forgot we were on the float. Yeah. <laughs> We've lost a lot of people at that time to just people forgetting, yeah. honestly. Um, Not all the doors. that was There was no OSHA. Yeah, sometimes you'd walk out a door and it would just be like, oh, Sky. Okay, going back. There's no... Later, Scott. They got rid of that wing. Yeah. So, uh, the boys had been kind of adjusting to life without Charles and even started planning their most expensive concert to date. Death Clock in a press conference recently announced plans for their first live show since its attack giving a much-needed boost to the world's economy. We know that the world is going through a tough time right now economically. We see a lot of businesses scaling down, but not us. We're going to put on the biggest, most expensive, elaborate live show that's ever been done. We're going to make spending money metal. Yeah, check it out. We made solid crystal posters, and they're not even for sale. Tickets are at double price. There's no recession for metal. The recession is an asshole. And with the untimely death of their manager, how will Death Clock continue to organize? their multi-trillion dollar business? We're not hiring a replacement manager. Too f- soon, Kimisabi. We're taking on all management uh, things. I am in charge of financial treasuries. And I'm here to financial business in years. I'm chief of financial receipts gathering. And I'm deputy president of financial money. And I'm in charge of snacks. F- Aren't you frightened of mismanaging? This man, Charles Oftenson, was considered by many a financial genius. What are your credentials? No, that's my credentials. We know what we're f- doing, ass. And with Death Clock in charge of their finances, how will they control their spending? Receipts have been submitted to the media that show billions of dollars squandered on vanity projects. $15 million was spent on Death Clock kitty shades, sunglasses for cats. $20 million was spent on the Super Tits Candy Snake project, which was never completed or defined. And finally, $85.5 million was spent converting 90 acres of land and corn silos into Cool Ranch Dorito dispensers. Welcome to Death Clock's Dorito Land. And I'd like to remind you all that Dorito Land is not open to the public. 
just for us. Sorry. Which brings us to now. With the economic world in flux, Death Clock has canceled all interviews to work on, quote, more important issues, unquote. Yeah, dude, the spending was absolutely getting insane. I mean, there were some people I know that couldn't cash their paychecks. There's other people that are, you know, eating shit, basically, but Dorito land, man. Fucking Dorito land. Yeah, that was a sight to see. It was uh, almost too much. But Death Clock was struggling without Charles and didn't know how to cope with this loss. The boys went on that spending spree with renovations at Mord House, but some would say they went way too far. First off, my favorite thing they added was Nathan activated sc did scream activated lighting all over Mord House, which costs about $89.9 billion, but it was metal as fuck. They also added, yeah, like a platinum practice chamber to... Squizgar requested it specifically $6.5 billion. Or his solid ruby metronome for $8.3 billion. That was pretty cool. A uh, champagne humidifier for $2 million. Then Pickles just went ape shit with a endangered species furniture room for $28 million. Uh, it, I, all there's sorts so of much shit here. Do I have to read it all? You guys have seen it. California condor yeah. bottle opener, $5 million. Gold-plated meerkat shelf holder, $30 million. Giant panda throw rugs for $2 billion. I mean, they went on a complete unwarranted spending spree. And I think... Just because of that, we should go to our sponsor. Just to pay some bills, let's hear from our sponsors. Goddamn right. Oh, when you're feeling all right, and you know you really get it, and it's really the times to watch it all. Super squares are the magical thing. It's a half navy deal to get sneaky in a tree. Talking bad double bad spearman cup. I'm talking bad double bad spearman cup. I'm talking. Yeah, so apparently still under contract. Yeah, we're obligated to play that. It just says it on the fucking right around. <laughs> we did not have control of that, but... Uh, yeah, and Tupplement Spearmint Gum. Thank you for sponsoring Deathcast, I guess. Fancy enough, it'll make your eyes bleed. Yeah. Um, well, with the boys' most expo expensive concert arising... Um, they were really put in kind of a vice grip by the record label. They were essentially forced to renegotiate terms with Crystal Mountain Records, uh, therefore forfeiting f billions of dollars to the new record head, Damien. Yeah. Real fucking asshole. Ass. The band was in over their head and didn't really r realize the true cost of being band manager. Nah, man. I mean, when you start making rock and roll, you don't really have to... You, you, you hire a nerd for that shit, man. Like Exactly. You, when your nerd's gone, you think you're smart. I mean, fucking, I think everybody would do the same shit, to it, be honest. It was clear that Charles was really the glue yeah. that held everything together here at Mord House. And, you know, looking back, it's obvious as fuck, but when you're living it, I just thought he was a nerd. Yeah. So did they, you know? Yeah, I mean, I listened to him, you know, he always seemed kind of, like, scared nice. The fuck, I've reiterated many times on this podcast, scared the shit out of me, but I thought it was a weird nerd. Yeah, it's crazy. It's obvious that now, looking at it, he's the glue. Oh, for sure. Yeah, none of us really realized, or I'd say we took it for granted, you know, yeah. at that point. But I remember this being a very dark time in Mord House. Um, a lot of our checks were bouncing left and right. A oh, like, only a couple people got paid, but then, like, it, like didn't work for some reason someone told me they were like it was gonna cash but it didn't yeah i don't remember but nobody really got paid uh, a lot of us turned to a life of crime because of that there was even like union dues we still had to pay the street gang the clocks do you remember them oh my god they arose we're doing petty crimes robbing people mugging uh, some light murder yeah. for money you know well you're around it all day you don't give a fuck i was roadieing for food uh, I remember you and some of my other like clocketeer friends were begging, and then you guys started rodeoing too. You're like, no, yeah, we're no, not fuck this. I'll just, here. I, I didn't really. It wasn't about an ego, but I was like, man, this can't. This, you know, they'll figure it out. So I didn't want to go roadie for anybody fucking else. That sucks. I was just like, you know, I'll do like some light roadie work. I don't know. I did some. It's some definitely lights. not below anybody. I just, yeah. you know, you do it for the best. I know. I just needed to make ends meet, and I, I thought it was over at that point. I, I had hope, and you know, uh, yeah, I was right, but hey, <laughs> hey, fuck you, no, you know, it has nothing to do with that. Hey, you know, let's lighten the mood, let's lighten the mood, man. Hmm. We're all getting paid now. Yeah, 
we have a new feature on Deathcast. That's because, right. Listen, I fucking hate the phone. I, and does, does do. Optus and make the rules? Is he the? Does he? Is he he's, he's signing the checks now because he's fine. I'm not at liberty to say. Okay. See, because there's, I have to touch it now. It's it's one thing to pick it up and answer it, but. Yeah. Now, you can text the word DEATH, D-E-T-H, all capital letters, to 1-800-ASK-CLOCK. Ask. Yeah, not clock. ass. Ask clock Yeah, some people think it's ass. It's not ass clock. It's ask clock. I 1-800-ASK-CLOCK. But no. not... I'm looking at the yeah, text at the death D E T H to one eight hundred ask clock and you can get a message for the show right yeah you, so you can message us from Mordhouse or from wherever or you can also follow us on Twitter at Deathcast for any polls or updates about the show and I'm happy to do my job are you gonna make a Twitter yeah I'll make it you got it I got a Twitter it's so much fun all right I'll get a Twitter yeah you can I'll do it Squizgar's got one now that's true I saw his ass on yeah. I read Twitter man yeah I'm on, I lurk. He was on there. Oh, okay. You got to come out of the shadows, yeah, 47. No, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not a contributor. <laughs> 47 is one of the shadows. Yeah. But why don't we check the text line and see what you guys are talking about. Uh, Clocketeer1875 says uh, he lived off waste and sewer water from the bowels of Mordhouse dungeons during this time and lost over 56 pounds. He calls it the toxins diet. Oh, my God. Is that supposed to be like Atkins diet? I think so. Um, it seems hey, like good it. for you. I hope you're still with us. I didn't see you on the in memoriam. Yeah, no, if you're living so. off a of sewer and ass, I think that he's probably <laughs> gone, but in memoriam. Yeah, uh, maybe. We'll, we'll add him to the next in memoriam, and yeah. if he's out there, then you show up. Shit, call in sometime if you're still alive, 1875. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. This one says, uh, from triple zero ninety eight says, I never thought the day would come, but we were tested by the great clock. There was a thinning of the herd. Dropping wheat gears like flies to make way for what came next. Like, this is... Oh, my God. This 98. Is just like, that guy's kind of a cynic. This, is just a, this isn't a diary, man. Next. Next. Uh, 3134 says, Hey, Deathcast, thanks for the great coverage. Uh, whatever happened to 420, did you guys find him? Um, I haven't heard from 420 yet. Bro, I... You, I, I hope he's okay. I'd say that guy's dead. I don't. I I have no idea. It sounded pretty bleak when we last heard from him on part two. Uh, he called in, and he was looking for pickles. I think, yeah. But I don't know, man. I, if I got you guys, let us know. On guy Twitter. was high out of his fucking you mind. Know. I don't. There's no way he survived. Uh, we just got a new one actually from five five five. Whoa. Yeah, it says I. Uh, I remember Death Clock having to watch their wallets after Crystal Mountain put the squeeze on them. Fuck Damien. I'm Fuck glad Damien. Lord Explosion pounded him. Yeah, that was awesome, man, to be honest. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we got a lot of these. You guys have been texting and just fucking call us, you dicks. Right. 321930 says, I wasn't a gear during this time, so what was it like to have to go back into the world after living at Mord House for so long? I just fucking, we just told you, dude. <laughs> it fucking sucked, man. I, I, when you rode in, you worked for the greatest band ever in the history of time and you fuck i mean i don't get all the luxuries that all of the lords do but yeah it, i wrote it ain't cash bad. okay i had a horrible couple days like i had a horrible couple days i don't want to talk about what i did when i wasn't living at mortis i wouldn't uh, have it any other oh, way before, uh, after uh, no we're not not talking about that um let's see six six five six six says <laughs> hey huge fan was wondering how long 616 and 47 have been friends, and what's the story of you two uh, working together before Deathcast? Uh, oh, okay. Well, why don't you answer that? I 47? mean, for a long how fucking did we time. Meet? Like, I'm you big we've, saucy bitch. I know, you sassy bitch. <laughs> uh, I mean, fuck, dude. Like, basically at the Academy, like we said before, we, we've discussed, like, what we did separately when we were joining at the Academy here to try and become a gear, but. Yeah. We had to fucking kill the guy that day, you know? Yeah. But, so that was a big day, but you just kind of get stuck in the barracks with people that you vibe with and people that you can grift with. And then, honestly, like I said, he had a multitude of jobs, like we've talked about throughout the time that we've been on this show. I've had the one direction I was trying to be yeah. in, so I just saw this guy to fuck there around. Were, but there were a couple shows that I even helped you out with, like, all the base stuff. Right. Because you were like, well, let me get 616. I need someone I know I can work with. Like, I know we did that Volcano show, I think. 
Yeah, no, like I said, you just live in the barracks together. We did a couple shows remember. together. There was, you were a journeyman. I remember, around the gear. I remember we worked a couple tours together. That was pretty fun. Um, what's a fun story of us working a tour with, with Death Clock? They all kind of run together after a while. After a long time, man, because there are hun- hundreds of shows. We're going on tours to fucking millions of places over and over and over and over and over. I'd say the most fun thing for me about tour is when I get to do recruiting. Because we recruit at a lot of our shows to be a clocketeer. Um, and a lot of people immediately just want to jump on tour, which that's not really how it goes. Right. Uh, you essentially get you sent, kill a guy. sent to Mord House, you know, and then like, you know, well, yeah, you get there and then you got to kill somebody. But there's a lot of other stuff. We've talked about it previously on Deathcast. I think more on, in the last part. But um, yeah, it's it's a crazy process. Me and 47 have worked together in a number of jobs, but I think the tour was... The most, most fun. fun we probably had together. So, you know, but ten, yeah, 10 years, it feels like at least for sure. But um, you guys can, again, text D-E-T-H death to 1-800-ASK-CLOCK <laughs> or uh, leave us a message on Twitter at DeathCast if you want to uh, tell us about your experience as a clocketeer or if you have any questions for DeathCast. I think Absolutely. that'd be fun. So let's keep it going. All good points and all good questions. Again, we appreciate your feedback. Everybody, thank you who's listening, all the Clocketeers for the support. We love you guys. Um, I do remember this time in the band's history being one, again, like 555 said. Thanks for calling in, Rockstar, by the way. Hell yeah. Um, They had to watch their wallets. It was crazy to see them kind of walking into weird establishments, like Demi Burger. I saw uh, that week they had a giant uptick in their prices, like their share prices. Uh, but it lasted for two straight weeks after Death Clock was seen there eating burgers like once. Oh my god, yeah. No, I mean, that's why you try not, I mean, they try not to blow up the spot you go, but when you're that huge, it's possible. Well, and everybody starts noticing. With no money and no options, the boys even turned to doing the renovations themselves. Due to budget cuts, they even had to switch to shitty liquor, causing their focus to drops and their attitudes to really be put on edge. No one wants to drink the swill, man. Oh, fuck no. You never drink, like, the house tequila yeah, don't do that no uh at this low point in the boys history it was uncommon to see multiple repo men at mord house at a time a lot of stuff was taken yeah a lot of shit getting ripped right out of the place i mean fucking those guys were dicks too they wanted me to help them fuck no i'll sit on it fuck yeah but with everything that happened leading up to the concert everyone was still so excited to see the most brutal and expensive death clock show to date uh, but with the world at a hush due to the fact that this was also their first show without Charles. The band intended to play a concert calling the label's bluff on shutting them down if they didn't sign the new contract. But as we saw Damien, that fucking asshole, pulled a goddamn plug. The first sight of brutality in the song crushed the industry off their third album. Uh, With the boys between a rock and a hard place, we were all but ready to sign the faded contract, um, sealing their fate and relinquishing all their fortune to Crystal Mountain Records and Damien himself. Within the light of a new era, a figure arose from the ashes like a phoenix to set the record straight and stop the boys from signing the contract. No one could believe it, but the dead man had risen. Charles Oftenson was back. back. And with the newfound encouragement, Nathan just gave Damien what he needed. Another sock to the face, and the boys were back at it. Hell yeah, dude. See, this was a fun time, man. Because, I mean, like, that's why I was letting you go. Because I was like, oh, yeah. I remember all this shit. Yeah. Like, like I said, Charles, he's, the nerd's fine. And he, he, I'm sure he does sign my check. So you're not a nerd, Charles. I couldn't believe Chuck he Kirk was still guy. alive, dude, honestly. Dude, that was one of the craziest days of, I think, everyone's life, period. Yeah, came back. He was scarred up obviously from his fight with the man with the silver face, but he was alive and uh, claimed he had a lot to tell the boys, Uh, but the time wasn't right. Now, we've discussed some pretty insane concert setups in my time uh, here on the show, Uh, but this was probably one of the most crazy and elaborate setups I've ever seen in my life. So much. I figured uh, between the synchronized swimmers and the ocean stage and all the different like laser lights laser lights fog. Nathan's microphone that was custom fit with electronic impulse a beacon technology that fired lasers into these giant globes filled with money they yeah, forget the forget truss rods and lighting bro I just we had to set up lasers yeah they fired these cannons out into the sky to ensure maximum carnage and really sell home the message that money was worthless uh, in the eyes of greatness 
Yeah, you're right. And, you know, after the show, the band had to express to Charles how they thought he was dead. And, and he answered by saying, you're right. I had to make sure I was pronounced dead. And you promised to tell the boys everything when the time was right. But explained that there's something much bigger than them going on and telling them they had a lot of work that they should start doing now. Yeah, for the first time, the threat to the boys was on a global scale. We saw armies rise and the threat and re challenge really become real. It felt like things were growing at an astronomical rate at this point, and there were uh, a lot of excitement around Mordhouse. I, I feel like we felt like things were finally taking off more than just being a band. It was more than that. It was a movement. Right. It was a... It still is. They've always uh, been vulnerable guys that obviously wear their emotions on the sleeve. For as, sure. As like rock stars do, but this was when we saw them vulnerable, and I was... I, I, it felt different. Like I said, it's been a confusing and weird time, but... But the glue was back. The glue. Yeah, but there was also that split division because there was between the known yeah, and the unknown. Yeah. Most of us did not know or have proper clearance to be fully informed on the situation at hand until the band was actually informed. So a lot of clocketeers didn't know what was going on. Charles didn't really tell a lot of people until he told the band. And then eventually there was that trickle down process. But sure. Project Falconback was coming. Now that the boys were back on top, they had the ultimate support system. They were feeling better than ever, but sometimes when you're feeling better than ever, you can become complacent. It's easy to be swayed into bad judgment calls and your PR way of thinking, I right. guess. Uh, one of the worst decisions the boys have ever made, and I think, is making Murder Face the face of anything. Oh my god, no, there's a reason he's supposed to be the guy... He's yeah. the fucking bass player. Yeah, he's he's supposed to just be chilling in the background, I don't keeping like things to, heavy. Don't you know? like to bag on us, but we're definitely not the face generally. Well, it's not a bag, but he's, he especially shouldn't be nah. the face of anything with a name and a face like that. The big news of the day. Death Clock bailed out of performing at the Michigan Metal Health Alliance benefit because, as stated by William Murderface, they weren't making any money off it. But the real backlash happened when Murderface, representing Death Clock, appeared on a popular political talk show. Death Clock doesn't owe you shit, pal, or anybody else. You need me to spill it out for you. Fine, I will. Hey, everybody in the whole shit world, we're Death Clock, and you can just suck our trillionaire. <laughs> we can't afford to pay our mortgages, and Death Clock is laughing at us. Damn, they've gotten too big. They used to be one of us. Now, this time, we actually get to see the elite, the media recovery team in work, and what it takes to keep the boys' image so sacred. Oh, yeah, and I mean, and at the same time, we get to learn the gruesome reality of the consequences of certain band members' negative words, but, you know. Oh, 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 shit. Awesome. He's calling. All right. So I have a little treat for us with this next call. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Fuck yeah. So I've always wanted to be part of, like, the elite team. You're like, you remember, like, the, the blackout media kidnapped plastic surgery guys, right? I remember you failing every last qualifying exam. Well, you're not wrong. Fuck you. But I finally figured out why I never passed any of them after a lot of self-reflection. Therapy going well? Dr. Smith Van Der Freud Jung is amazing, yes, really close to a breakthrough, but that's besides the point. I ended up realizing that I just uh, wasn't brutal enough. Don't say that, man. It's no, it's it's okay. It's it's okay. I've I've come to terms with it. I'm plenty brutal in my day to day life. Don't get me wrong. But there's our lifestyle of brutality, and then there's their level of brutality. Did you get into the spare yopo again? You're not making any sense. No, man, we live in brutality. This guy is brutality. Here, l let's talk to him. He'll set your fucking taint straight. We both talk to him? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm just gonna pop him on speaker. Hey, 555, thanks for calling me back. I didn't know if you had the time, but we appreciate it. Yeah, man, it's me, 616 as well. He wanted you to explain to me how brutality levels are different. Something to do with a lifestyle versus... Living brutally. Yeah, I, uh, wasn't really prepped to do a multi-party pitch, but, uh, uh, just give me a second. The pitch. You got this. You got this. Kill. 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 <clears throat> so, you don't feel brutal enough. Yeah, so that's why I... Is life passing you by with a veneer of brutality? Like teeth? 
do you want to elevate your status by eating, breathing, and shitting pure barbarism? Yeah, yes. yes. Then you motherfuckers are ready to start living through brutality. D yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I said on the phone. I'm, I've, I've failed at every element of the elite team exams Failing and- is for failures. I mean, by definition. The eviction litigation interpersonal transformative engineer team was founded on the elimination of failure. Failure is for the weak, the feeble, the scum. We the get it. 47 sucks. Would you fucking not? Please, please. I say this not to belittle 47's shortcomings, but to inspire him to dig himself out of that hole, much like we leave the majority of our patient transients to do for themselves. Yeah, I've seen your work. What you do is pretty close to sanctioned sadism. Thank you. It's what my entire goal has been since I could stand up. I've always been inclined to inflict as much pain for my pleasure on as many people as possible, and so once I had the ability to confer with Oftensen on the course of action this team required, I just felt my soul completely disappear, and it was the most accomplished I'd ever felt. Until I realized I needed to share my passion with the world. That's, uh, cool? Uh, how are you? Better living through brutality is my step-by-step -step guideline on how to enrich your life by embracing your inner brutal self and then learning to view others' lives as less than. So wait, you turned into a self-help grifter? That's a harsh description, and I thank you again. While grifting is the lowest of the low in terms of unnecessary vitamin supplements, boner pills, and taint wipes, I would like to think of myself as an entrepreneur of evil. So while yes, I created the ultimate mental reprogramming procedure to truly ruin one's life, I decided to branch out and take a step beneath that scum and sell a lifestyle. I'm so goddamn lost. What, what is happening? Wait, before we get to the grift, I've always wanted to know, is the brainwashing style, is it like clockwork orange or what? Mm. Great ideas are great ideas for a reason. So while not exactly the same, it is inspired by the classic. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sure. Well, the forcible viewing is still the best option, but we've changed the eye drops from artificial tears to straight LSD. So not only are they staying awake against their will, they are tripping balls upon the image viewing. Uh, I, I, I hate to ask. They're forced to stare at a close-up of Master Murderface's rancid dong flashing intermittently between flaccid and- Holy fucking brain rot, we get it. Ugh. Did he know his junk was being used as torture material? He volunteered once he heard of the project. Yeah, no fucking surprise there. The botched plastic surgery was all his idea, by the way. I had intended to make them look like Rocky Dennis from Mask. Master Murderface said to not make them look like anything, and to just make one of the food prep clocketeers do it. He is by far the most brutal band member in actual day-to-day -day lifestyle. A true inspiration. Yeah, no argument there. He sucks in the best way, though. So you're saying unless I'm living, breathing, sleeping harm against others, I'm never going to be brutal enough to join? That's where you need my guidance. My book, Better Living Through Brutality, or BLTB, leads you through a program that breaks down your inner empathy and provides the path to a life of schadenfreude. Wait, I've been trying to learn a little German since our Weichlinghammer interview. Uh, but why? We're never going to talk to that leather phrase fucking prick again. I know, I just realized that German is just really evil sounding, man. I, I, yeah, I, I guess. Well, the word itself is proof. He said schadenfreude. Indeed. Ha, see? Happiness at the misfortune of others. <laughs> Motherfucker, they have one single word for that shit. Tell me that's not evil. Really? Really. I learn something new every day. Uh, well, uh, so what you're telling me is that, wait, so, so, wait, so huh? Do I just, do I have to read your book just to join the elite team? 
What we do on the Elite Team is not achievable by simply applying or passing tests, but proving your inner brutality through action. But, so did the application or tests even matter? Why the hell did I stress out if they were just bullshit? Oh, ho, 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 they matter for sure. They alert us to your interest, and then we initiate the real review on our end. Okay, so kind of like a secret test. More like an unformed lifestyle report using hidden recording equipment. More like an invasion of privacy? What the actual fuck? I mean, like, where were the cameras? Not were, friend. No, uh, no, 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 fuck. Why? Holy shit, wait, what? Is he still under, the, what, what do you call it? Review? Reporting? Ding, ding. Uh, all right, my brain is getting whiplash, man. This makes me happy. This makes me very happy. So finally, please, for the hate of everything that is holy, can I just fucking read the book and finally be on the team then? Read the last page. I don't have a copy, though. It's available as an ebook. Don't worry, man. I've already got it pulled up. What? What the actual fuck, man? What, what? Man, I'll pay you back. Like, how much? $66,600. For a last page? It's not reaching the New York Times bestseller list, so I price it to my targeted audience. I'm not buying it, man. But, but you've already got it all pulled up. I don't have that much at all. You know our salary is basically nothing. You got that out topic credit card, though. I knew I should have never told you about that shit. Not your limit, at least. I know, but I know the balance is on there. Yeah, with 87% interest. Fucking and? Fuck. I hate that I'm gonna just do it. Thanks, babe. Your ass owes me. I'll make you dinner. Dinner and $666,000. Okay, well, last page, last page, last page, last page. If the reader of this book has been alive for the duration since their initial application and 666 weeks have passed, they will immediately be inducted into the elite training team to start brutality tra- 666 weeks? How the fuck long is that? I suck at math. Give me a second. Hold on. Uh, 12.8 years. Uh, when did I first apply? It was so long. Who, who the hell can remember that? Sweet. Sweet 47. You think we wouldn't have the receipts? Right, right. Yeah, you guys watched me without. Oh, wait. Did you. Did you guys see me? Uh, I, can, I can explain, but after you tell me when I first applied. November 15th, 2009. Uh, math, man. Come on, math. The. Uh, uh, 666 fucking weeks. Are you shitting me? I'm in! I can kiss this fucking bullshit life. Goodbye. Hell yeah. Thanks. Oh, like your wood- Like your ass wouldn't give up all this shit in a heartbeat to join. Come on. I mean- well, Gentlemen, before I let this devolve into an even more devastating lover's spat, hey. allow me to introduce a more devastating reality. 47. You seem to be literate, yet you're glossing over the biggest qualifier. What what qualifier? I mean, fucking not get caught. Okay, it's 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 been almost that many weeks. I read it. I bought the. I mean, I bought. the- Listen, I bought the book. All right, fuck. fuck. He bought the book. I read the last line. I'm alive for the duration. Now you're getting it. Ah. Uh... Oh, man, fuck you. I am clearly not dead. Not what the in memoriam says. I, 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 look, I faked it, man. I just wanted some fucking time off. Like I said, I'm here. Look at my tattoos, man. And shouldn't faking your own death be even more brutal than, like, even all the shit that you're doing? Sir, while using someone's death to fake your own is quite scandalous, Know that there is no more evil, more heinous, and obviously more brutal invention than fine print bureaucracy, especially when we offer no exemptions and no refunds. Thanks for the purchase, and 47, just stay alive for another 12 some odd years and we'll talk again. Ta. Hey. 
hey, man, it could happen to anyone, okay? No, 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 don't fucking touch oh, me. Okay, I got you. I got you. Well, <clears throat> sorry that you guys had to go through that with us. Maybe we should look into pre-recording these. I guess we uh, live and learn. So don't buy this fucking book or do? Shit. Fuck. This is the ultimate fucking brutal action, huh? But what is? Grifting other gears into buying your fake self-help book that only fits a narrow-ass guideline and then even disqualifying disqualifying you on a technicality. Fuck. It's fucking me up, man. I don't I don't see any other way of putting it than righteously brutal. Hmm. Well, yeah. God damn it. You know what? What? You're right. I just got out brutal by the guy who literally wrote the fucking book on it, so... Shit, I hate to do it, but kudos, 555. You truly embody brutality. And you know what else? Fuck you, and fuck every last relative you have up the ass with the rusty tie rod. But I appreciate you nonetheless. Cheers? Cheers, I think. Now, on top of the negative press the band received, they also felt pretty stupid after the European commercial for Pentuplement Gum aired in Spain, and uh, I don't remember it going very well. The boys had to rush out immediately afterwards. Yeah, I mean, I I know we had to worry that again. We have to to play the thing. Yeah. In in an effort to appease these angry fans, they lifted the ban on all cover bands across the globe, which is good, right? Yeah. And that's when we found out that Toki was in Thunder Horse playing as Squizgar, which still (laughs) felt kind of weird, to be honest. Yeah, that was kind of fucking weird. Yeah, Squizgar kept accusing me of stealing all his pants that week. (laughs) For like a couple weeks, actually. That's awesome. Yeah, he he got really mad. Uh, I was actually put into punishment for that, so. Why would he wear his pants, though? Just wear the wig. Yeah, I was like, dude, we just buy the same pants. That's like, fucking it's, weird. I'm not taking your pants. Like, Something people wrong. can buy the same thing as other people. Something he buys cheap pants, you know? I don't know. Um, Anyways. But, um, yeah, I actually think we have another caller on the line. One yeah, second. Let me uh, fucking, all right. Thanks for calling Clocketeer 111654. It says here that you're the official French toast holder for Death Clock? And you were actually there while they were discussing that cover band thing. And wait, it you were actually featured in the documentary in multiple scenes. Oh, yeah, 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 man. I've been in the French toast circuit all my life. Even worked a couple other pretty big bands in my career. You know, Motley Crue, Death Leopard. But in my heart, I always knew I was a gear, so this felt like home. But, you know, anyways, the guys actually went through about 50 cover bands that day, and we didn't get to see them in the documentary, but they ended up approving a few of them outside of Thunder Horse. Yeah, I remember there were a couple other cover bands in existence, but I don't really remember hearing a lot about them, much like we did with Thunder Horse. What were a few of those unheard cover bands that you remember hearing about? Well, there's the Horror Clocks, Clock Play, Blood Recuted jock clock the reggae cover band they're actually really cool guys and they're doing half a tour with the boys in their 2009 european tour but i think my favorite cover band is probably the hip-hop duo clock and crunk their cover of going to the water is pretty stellar you know it's pretty generous of our lords to let other people cover their music without the punishment of death i think it shows a real human side to their nature I really want to check out that reggae cover band. Maybe I'll have you text me the Spotify link. In any case, was there anything else you wanted to leave our listeners? Maybe a little tidbit of information that we didn't know before? Well, as a level C French toast holder, I'm not allowed to say much due to my lack of clearance. But what I can say is that Murderface only eats French toast that's been lathered with bacon grease, for example. And Toki always cuts the crusts off. Geniuses, man. Eccentric. And I fucking love them. Have a great day and hail Death Clock. Oh, yeah, dude. I mean, Death Clock went to go see Thunder Horse and some shit-stained hole in the wall, but you could tell they were blown away by the music and the reaction that they saw from the crowd. So, they immediately kicked all the people out and became Thunder Horse themselves. Yeah, for the first time, the disconnect from the fans was the catalyst the boys were finding their roots in in the most narcissistic way that metal could allow. 
a tribute to themselves. So fucking awesome. Over the next few days, they would be left alone without management or any of us. And I remember uh, a lot of anxiety amongst the gears at this time. We couldn't help our masters. Right. I mean, they all like to shell up. We've talked about that many times. It's obvious. They like to hold themselves in when they're fucking pissed about anything. But when you don't hear from them at all, when yeah. you don't even hear the complaining, that's fucking... It's like when your dad tells you he's disappointed, he's not mad. And you're like, ugh. Oh, yeah. There was a huge party the day they came back to Mordhouse. Hell, yeah. Yeah. For sure. Uh, the band turned a new leaf by throwing a massive benefit concert in Egypt at the foot of the Sphinx uh, to show their support for animal neutering. I remember those crazy machines that got to rip out the balls of all the animals. Those are pretty fucking yeah, insane. That's actually like a really high... S- uh, we should be using that everywhere, man. Yeah, that was Australia's really Australia's got tech. a huge problem. Yeah. Oh, for sure, dude. They spent a million on research for ball removal to make it as quick as possible, but it's brutal to watch, which was a crazy kind of concept, I guess. Bob Barker would be proud. Yeah. Anyway, there was a cat accident, and they accidentally tri- triggered the super base, toppling the Great Sphinx and almost killing our lords. A cat accident is as hilarious as it sounds. Yeah. (laughs) For the first time ever, Death Clock had to face their own mortality and accept that they were mere mortals. For weeks, we couldn't use the word murder Murder. at Mord House. We had to say hamburger Hamburger time. time. Anyone caught not saying hamburger time time was thrown into solitary for no less than a month. With the fear of... Hamburger time looming over death clock's head. They went in for testing of all kinds, including a urine test to start, uh, but not before partying and drinking crazy amounts at the Cayman Islands. Right. It was nuts. Why? I didn't get a go. Nah. 42, uh, 420 apparently went. Uh, well, he of course. Had, he, was, he was supposed to tell a story. Drug that was when he was on. supposed to call Death Gas. So I don't even know. Guys, you got to stop asking me about 420. I don't, I don't get it. But we have no fucking clue. Speaking of doing drugs. We have a special message from Face Bones. How to not act like a dickweed while you're on drugs. Marijuana is legal now. Can you believe that? Face bones can't. And so is booze, but it's always been for a while. So let's talk about being reasonable when drinking booze, smoking pot. 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 Smoking pot. Facebook's dead. Facebook secretly smoked pot before the show. Don't call the cops. But you can bet that Facebook sucked the dick of the deities of Mary Kane. Vaporizer. Vape it up, heavy metal pals. You're my friends. Your face bones is friends. We live in a town called Friendshipville. Oh, wow. Trippy times are afoot in Friendshipville. Join me on a friend. Fun trip in time tunnel into our collective unconscious. We are all face bones. I mean, think about it. Face bones might have gotten a little too high. Face bones is feeling weird. Oh, now face bones likes it. Face bones is having a good time. So anyway, try your best to only partake in what you can handle because no one wants to be responsible for your dumpy ass. Uh, Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Face Bones. Yeah, dude, that guy always takes a fucking turn. Appreciate it, bud. Uh, That's good advice. The message is strong. Strong moral compass there with Face Bones. And on our health. Yeah, anyway, the test results, the urine results came back, and Pickles was dying. 
Um, it was at this time we learned Pickles was dying and millions were were mourning. Sorry, I still get kind of emotional just thinking about it. Right. Uh, millions began pre mourning his death. Things at Morthouse were tragic to say the least, as there was a mass depression killing off thousands of clocketeers. Um, although, funny enough, you yeah, know. we learned that it wasn't even Pickles P that was getting tested. It was Toki's cat. Yeah. So I mean. There's always something going on with these fucking guys. I mean, like, the odds that I feel like anybody would have actually, like, submitted a regular piss test. Yeah. Zero out of ten. They've been oh, doing this sure. on the road for years. Yeah. It's it's pretty standard for them. So, I mean... Point. They submitted each other's. Yeah, but then someone submitted fucking the cats as pickles, and here we are. Yeah. And uh, but it was an interesting couple days. Unfortunately, though, because it was Toki's cat, and any other creature that we've seen get too close to Toki, the cat died a horrible, painful death kind of right before his eyes. Like yeah, cat. which is all too common with Master Wartooth, you know? Yeah. It was tough, man, because Toki really loved that cat, and I think so much that he spent what, billions of dollars memorializing him forever in a sarcophagus made of pure gold and was Russian dolled into each about 30 of each other's airlifted to Egypt to give one of the most brutal ceremonies we've ever had. Yeah, it actually crushed the Sphinx again. Yeah. It was like 20 times the size and tipped over on top. You know, as I Very do, brutal. As I do these things, I remember all the other fucking shit that kind of goes along with what we do. Mm-hmm. Like crushing the Sphinx. Yeah. yeah. It's a world of brutality. Gotta break a few eggs. You can't quite fight the brutality is, is what we're trying to say. Um, it'd been a long year at Mord House with plenty of changes and to speak, uh, when I speak of changes, I, I literally mean like things in Mord House had never been like this before. Right. But, uh, we were all looking forward to Christmas that year. For me, it was, it was different. I don't really celebrate Christmas, uh, it, it, but it become a kind of a solace from our normal routines. Right. I enjoy it. I mean, it's just a, it's just a, it's the time of year, man. Yeah. Although Christmas was coming though, the, the panic was really felt by the boys when they got word that their mothers would arrive for the holidays. And that's the other fucking part of Christmas for everybody, man. Mm hmm. No one, <laughs> nobody wants to be around the family for the holidays. Not that long. Oh God. It's brutal as fuck. You do, you're weird. <laughs> uh, it was also at this time we see murder face decided to partner with Dick Nubbler to put on a Christmas special on the grounds of Mord House. Most of us were pretty weary about a Christmas special due to Murderface's long track record of failures, such as the Murderface Titty Time Car Wash, which he had to pay lawsuits for driver <laughs> damages to their cars. I like that place, though. And then remember the Planet Piss Cologne, which the FDA found piss in every bottle, but well, it was that, disgusting. Yeah, but that... I mean... Yeah, I, I, I what do you know. expect? But people broke out in irreversible skin rashes. I thought it was some sort of like it was synthetic. No, I guess there was piss in there, man. It was horrible. And then the, we all remember the murder face home pyro kit, which there were dozens of deaths due to that. Again, don't let him. Don't, why are we letting him put his face on things? It's we, not the little guy's we, fault. We should never. We've learned this before. Let's learn it again. Uh, with all the failures, uh, that kind of made Dick make. Murderface give him all the con creative control on the project. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, no, it was a definitely a good call to not have Murderface have any control. That guy should never have control. Like, oh yeah, I don't think we can overstate this enough. No, we keep bringing it up, but I'm going to continue to do so. <laughs> you worked with the man more than I did. You know better. Yeah. Uh, even though it's not common practice around Mordhouse to give uh, gifts or receive gifts, Toki always kind of takes it upon himself to spread some Christmas joy. And so he went shopping with a small group of the boys, some of the clocketeers, which I kind of right. feel like I, I was jealous. I wanted to go shopping with him for Christmas. I feel like that would have been a fun day. That would have been awesome, to be honest. I mean, that'd be, the guy loves that shit. It would be fun to do. But yeah. although, you know. Although the boys hated Christmas, they were welcome to it for that year, dressing uh, the house a little more brutal than normal, putting pig's blood yeah. and rotting meat all yeah. over the tree, which really kind of gave it that, like, just brutal piece de resistance. Yeah, you absolutely. Know? It was amazing. It smelled horrible. Yeah, there, but... it left a horrible smell in the house, but it's whatever it takes to make Christmas brutal, I guess. Yeah, you know. Uh, while Toki was Christmas shopping, though, we see that he made a startling discovery when he went to sit on Santa's lap that year. It was not Santa. It was his old friend. Dr. Fuck off. I forgot. I forgot. <laughs> Dr. Roxo. Roxo. Unfortunately, we saw him befriend him once more. And the twisted clown was released from jail on parole. Bringing him back into the house was a huge risk for all of us. And we would soon see the fruits of that labor. 
but while we were more under stress for the mothers uh, and having to take care of them for the band, uh, I feel like that kind of made everything worse. Yeah, that, it heightened fucking everybody's... <sighs> yeah, the stress level was at an all-time high around Mordhouse. Murderface and Nubbler had their Christmas special, which, funnily enough, was sponsored by the Christian Church. And the I bet they regret evil. that now institution yeah. on the planet right but i bet they really regret that now it was a shit show it was metal as fuck but that was awesome it was though. such was a awesome, shit show though. i i remember that dr roxo getting a hand job uh <laughs> oh yeah i remember dr roxo i start to like that guy a little more you, today you remember he stole all the presents for cocaine money see again fucking tool dude hilarious though the rumor was we were getting new death phones too so fuck that guy god uh, I've had the same again, death phone since like again, 2009, okay? It goes right back down. Every time he Not fucking cool. took our death phones, man. Is that no, what he was since doing? 2006? Yeah, I think. I thought he was, uh, I thought he was just stealing shit. Seven. No, no I got a new man, one in fuck. 2007. Uh, it was clear that the boys' stress level was getting crazy due to their mothers. And it was, it was tearing Death Clock apart at that point. Uh, the boys had already gotten in touch with their roots, but the familiar bonds weren't as metal as they wanted them to be. Oh, wait. Ah, all right, you know what, man? Nah, you're doing this one. Okay. I'm still... I asked the last guy to call, but I'm fucking pissed still, man. It's I don't, okay. Dude, just I fucking... Know. Here, I'll get it. Here. Well, it looks like we have Clocketeer 1124 on the line to tell us about Death Clock's Christmas decorations. How's it going, 1124? What can you tell us? Well, 616, it was a little different from my usual role as the Clocketeer Undertaker. Miss Explosion was quite firm on the matter of decorations. We must decorate Maud House because we're a family and it's Christmas and we've got to celebrate. And she pointed at me, so Operation Pine was a go. I immediately assembled a team. We split into two. Team Wreath was in charge of acquiring the finest decorations and Team Angel was sent to get a tree. I was personally in command of Team Angel as we flew all the way to the North Pole while remotely guiding Team Wreath. A small one, she is. My Madeleine, bless her, never failed me once. One team had all the best fighters, the other all the best strategists. After all, few things are as violent as Christmas shopping. Everyone knows that. It was vital for the optics that Team Angel were led presentially, so sadly I had to pass on punching some angry grannies for the time being, but don't worry, I took down their license plates. So why not call the Team Pine instead of Angel and name the operation something else? We were flying. Angels fly. The, the, the tree was the goal. I mean, what dots are you not seeing here? Got it. Looks like you missed out on some of the fun. How did you manage to lead two teams at once? Oh, please. I can do that with my eyes closed. I once led four teams in two different operations while making gnocchi from scratch for dinner and watching TV in the bath. Oh, okay. Gross. And who's Madalena? The aircraft. Yes, old Maddie and I go a long ways back. Oh... <laughs> If only she could talk. I'm glad she can't, though. <laughs> okay, not engaging there. How did that operation end up going? We flew as fast as the wind. Got there in a second. I tell you, how girls are beauty. We landed in the middle of nowhere. Great landing, as always. She's a champ, my Maddie. My sweet, sweet Maddie. I guided the team through the woods. We had to find not just a nice-looking tree, you know? Only the best for our lords. We had to find the most metal and grandiose tree in the forest. Some bears did attack us on the way, but no big deal. We found the tree, cut it down, carried it back, and fought some more bears on the way, and ended up making some extra presents as bath mats, even. Then we realized we had greatly underestimated the sheer magnitude of this tree. I think we made some new initiate count the rings, and once he got to 666 BCE, we figured it was good enough. Thanks to Mads, a, a few tie-down straps and some duct tape, we were back before we knew it. A bit of a struggle of getting that onto Maud House, but we are damages, as that wasn't my first Christmas. I had to knock down two walls and bore a hole in the roof, but bing bang boom, Christmas saved. Damn, and... sounds like a successful venture. Uh, what about Team Wraith? Same story? <coughs> of course, well, 
Uh, meanwhile, in Team Wreath, we're still fighting the Maul Grannies, so we had to lend them a hand. People just won't let go. Not, not the good stuff, anyway. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I almost ripped out a father's eyes in front of his kids to get the last big star. Almost. And it took longer waiting in line than the whole Angel mission. <laughs> Some of us didn't make it, naturally, and we, we lost two to a mauling malicious Maul Walker's walker, armed with razor wire, but it's all part of the process. We got the items, so their sacrifices weren't in vain. Numbers 463-917-4081. They all died as heroes. How did the third one die? Just to keep the In Memoriam up to date. It's all kind of a blur. I, th I think he got he got trampled or shot. Oh, shit, no. no. <laughs> now I remember, yes. The 4081 was bitching about wanting a hot cocoa and a wrathful maul elf poured a vat of boiling chocolatey cow colostrum on him from the second floor. Yeah. His skin just sloughed off, all while a crackling Dean Martin elucidated his rapacious intentions via a blown-out PA system was decking the halls with auditory balls of assault. Holy shit, how did I forget that? Alright, that of chocolate. Huh. That sounds less brutal than in reality. Probably smelled really good though, right? Like pork rinds dipped in cacao. So, um, as soon as we got back to Maud House, we rushed to the gift wrapping dungeon. We hauled them all up to the chimney and squoze our heftiest gear 989 down with some livestock lube, spit, and good intentions, and loaded the presents under our perfect tree with uh, care, I guess. Mission accomplished once more. We made Mrs. Explosion proud, or so she slurred until passing out on a pile of popcorn on a string. Whoa, that is impressive. Who knew Christmas shopping and decorating was so brutal? Their sacrifices will be remembered indeed. Thank you for your call. That was a great story. Ungrateful work, yes. I ain't done yet. Oh? Lord Explosion himself later sent us on another mission. Our decoration wasn't metal enough, uh, apparently. We had failed for the time being, but luckily this one was much simpler. Head to the kitchen, get pig's blood, organs, rotting meat, and huck it on the tree. <laughs> Piece of cake compared to the, the mall incident. Oh my god, dude. I don't care if you asked him to do it. Man, like, that's fucking... It smelled like absolute shit in there, dude, for weeks, dude. Weeks. Fuck. It's not my fault if you can't handle the smell. Task assigned, task completed. Smell you later, pig shots. After the holidays, the stress of family ties seemed to linger in the air at Mord House. Squizgar began to feel the sting of not knowing who his own father was, and to too many people, it was obvious. Legendary Dead Clock guitarist Squizgar Squid Elf has proven to be quite the ladies' man over the years. But has that come back to haunt him? Recent lawsuits claim that he's fathered literally thousands of illegitimate children. Of course, that entire case was thrown out after the following was submitted. Squizgar is in no way the legal father, guardian, etc. of these children. Uh, you see, in order to get backstage or have any kind of audience with Squig Elf, every man, woman, and child must sign a paternity waiver. That legally disallows even the notion that Squizgar could be the father of their children, regardless of a potential positive DNA test. Is there a bigger connection here? Squizgar Squig Elf never actually met his father. Is that why he feels the need to father so many illegitimate children? Is the lack of a father in Squig Elf's life the reason he became a guitar god? And can he stay a guitar god? Is the pressure of being a deadbeat father getting to him? He even canceled several Death Clock dates, citing guitar exhaustion. How can a man continue this kind of sexual promiscuity and still lead a normal life? Is Squig Elf on the verge of a nervous guitar breakdown? Thousands of families were receiving college tuition, food stamps, an entire Death Clock discography, and of course, $5 off a Hot Topic at the cost of Mord House. And that is a lot when you begin to think of how many kids there are. Right. There, there's a sense of true class division. That's the way I'd put it. Yeah. Uh, at the time, we were still moving up in rank. 
Uh, I remember because of all the money they had to spend for this stuff, we had um, to use like one ply to the toilet paper. That was horrible, man. It's, it should be illegal. Yeah, it had been like left in the rain and like due to budget cuts, we had like no lunches some days. Let's just say like there was some questionable meat on the days when we did have lunches. Didn't want to go into detail, didn't want to ask. Because of all the money that had to get spent on Squizgar's kids, it was a lot. But through it all, we survived. Fuck. Just crazy to think Fucking about. Fucking made it, man. Anyway. Uh, where was I? I digress. That was just nuts. Uh, Squizgar decided to search for his father after all this time, and Oftison was really supportive of that. I think that was really cool. Um, assigning a special clocketeer to help. Naturally, once the news hit, the world stepped up, and millions of men claimed to be Squizgar's dad, mostly for fame. Oh, shit. Look at it. Oh, speak of the devil. Someone is calling. Look. <laughs> Fuck. And coming up next, we have the guy who helped Squizgar through the absolute brutal process of trying to find out who his father was. You know him as the... All right. I'm not reading this. What? Like, what? What is it? Oh, oh holy ass piss. Did this douchebag write his own introduction? What else? Sorry, sorry to our listeners now that the word that the cast has gotten out and spreading and everybody knows about us all the uh yeesh how do i put it uh, uh bottom feeders with egos yes spot fucking on yes all the bottom feeders with egos have started to reach out and uh you figure they want to interview with a couple of them and all of a sudden they're pro wrestlers writing a brief brief intro that we asked for their role was they're like getting way too theatrical with it that's when you kind of find out who the real no internet haver should be. All right. I mean, like, I, I hate these guys, but it couldn't have been that bad. Uh, um. Oh, yeah, I think. Give it a shot. Go ahead. All right. All right. Uh, 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 fucking really? Just yeah, you scrote. Keep going. Uh, gross. All right. Coming up from the foamy, wet, rapid city, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Does he think that's a fucking flex? That's so weird. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> he spent his time as a god in crisis and pushed the boundaries of forearm fortitude. You know him as, oh, fuck, man, fuck this. I hate him. I hate this Almost shit. Almost there. Uh, you're an asshole. Come on. The semen demon. Yeah. All right. All right. You know what, man? I'm not sticking around for this. Nope. Nope. Hey, hey, remember what we talked about, huh? Come on. Yeah, yeah, all right, yeah, I remember. Yeah? N know where, where the, the other, other guy has to, to clean. clean. All right. Good, don't worry. I'll deal with him completely. Now fuck off and blare your Enya. I mean, I don't, I don't. <laughs> Shut up. You know, I know you're going through your myriad, and it's a heavy yeah. Encino flow day. Just give it over. Uh, it's already queued up. There, there's chocolate in the drawer for you. Uh, uh, word, word, words. Yeah, yeah. Uh, nah, it's fucking. All right. Well, you, thank, thank you. Fucking. We'll talk about this later. Off mic, you dick. Thought so. Christ. How did we get here? Cheers. Hmm. Yeah. Fuck. Well. I'm gonna keep this shit as short as possible and turning your headphones up to the last song you'll ever hear. Level. If he's got to have his Enya, make sure he's always got his Enya. Dick. Hello? Shit, hit the button already. Uh, hey, two, three, four, six, how's it going? You read the intro, right? I, uh, you know, it was so good that 47 wanted to take the reins on it, and, uh, he did a good amount of takes, and that's why he's, uh, resting. Oh, cool. Thanks. I was just fucking self-conscious about the writing. Nah, man, you're good, you're good. Just, uh, yeah. It is what it is. So, uh, fuck. Where was I again? This guy! Yeah. How the hell? Uh, whatever so... So, Jizz guy. Please, please, please. Semen demon. No. First and hopefully only question. How did you get into DNA studies? I like it. Straight to the point. Just like fresh ejaculate. Well, it started off like any other jack-off gets into anything by fucking jacking off. Ugh. Ugh. That's gross. You guys mind if I smoke in here? So you know how post-nut clarity is the best way to get into a clear and focused mindset. 
It's a thing. I definitely can assure you. It works for the ladies, too. Don't say ladies. Ever. Copy. Felt it, too. Any hoozle, I went skeet skeet shooting and had this ultimate hero gasm that landed on a microscope slide. Then, boom, before you know it, Mrs. Sanderlingston m grabbed it and. You were in fucking class? I didn't have a microscope at home. Not some fucking nerdy ass nerd pe penis. Nerd penis. Nerd penis. So she grabbed the slide and immediately she knew something was up. She definitely fucked. I hate my ears. Well, she looked at me and started screaming at how gross and sadistic and unfit for society I was. All while making me look at the slide under the scope holding my neck. Ugh. Immediately, I made gray gravy again. Then, it was at that post-nut moment, I knew I had to research DNA. Are you even qualified for... existing? I can assure you my purpose and my qualifications are two very different subjects. That shouldn't be weight. What's your purpose? To serve whomever, whenever it may be needed. Let's go with this then. If we heard right during this documentary, then you had to rifle through thousands of potential Squidsguard dads. You had to help with that, right? Some sort of staff to keep things moving along? Keep track of how many swabs? That just, you know, that can't be a one man job. But I can't picture anyone working with, for, or around you. What's your process? Of course it was just me. You can't have all that sensitive material just available to anyone. Also, budget, or whatever. It costs a lot in lube and flights. I'm not gonna- Lube, you ask? Why, to get a shitload of DNA, you best be lubed up. So, cheek swabs, strand of hair, blood, none of these forms of DNA were available? Yeah, most DNA testing is done through any of those methods, and even more. General, generally, loads are more for criminal cases, I think. I mean, you're, you're joking, right? Our little swimmers are chock a cock full of the stuff. Blood, you know, it has like fucking blood in it, and spit is just gross. Would have been easier, I guess, but... And it probably would have been quicker and cheaper. Oh, God. Hey, hey, man, are you, you okay? Oh, uh, I'm, uh, you know, just processing that the biggest accomplishment of my life is a... Just a, a farce. A farce. A farce. I thought I was... I thought... I jacked off so many Scandinavians, so... Is he fucking God. gone yet, man? Fucking might be. Hey, man! God. It's not, you know, it's not the end of the world. How did you... Uh, get to work with Squid... I'm a failure. Yeah, but... My whole... Purpose... My whole life is a... Is a lie. Hey, hey, not another one. Uh, at least not on air. You've got so much to do. <laughs> I got you, fucker. <laughs> I know there's other ways for that shit, but guess what? Come on. Come on. Guess. No. Ugh, what? I love God. What in the absolute fucking John Waters nightmare shit was that? Hey, hey, man, it's over. Oh, oh, all right. Oh, okay. Oh, I mean, oh, okay, yeah, I don't know. He was a big, he was, he was big of an asshole as we thought. I wasn't listening. I want to rip my ears out. I, it seems like it, I figured. Well, and anyway, 
Anyways, uh, you know, g- g- go ahead. Let's get out of g- get out of the headspace, man. Come, yeah. on, come on, come on, This guy fucked my brain up. During the chaos, whilst Master Squizgarf was gone, Master Wartooth began trying to take creative control over the band, seeing himself as kind of the, the, the best guitarist. He was the only guitarist. All right. I mean, it's fucking guitarist for you, though, in general. And, you know, when, you know, when, when you... When you're stuck in the spotlight, though, then yeah. you don't want to let it go, I don't think. I, I think Toki just couldn't handle the spotlight, and it started getting to his head, and everyone could tell. it was it, Things were clearly not okay when Squizgar was gone. Uh, Pickles was having father issues, so was Toki. Murderface was trying to be everyone's dad. It was, it was really complicated, and once Squizgar fled uh, to become a mere mortal, uh, working on a lumber yard with his stepdad, uh, pretty much his mom's boyfriend. Right. The band dynamic did begin to d- uh, dissolve. Murderface's lust for Squizgar's mom was <laughs> a truly destructive path. That was so fucking, he's so gross. I think, and honestly, like I was saying, him playing father to Toki and Pickles was also just like bringing up everyone's childhood trauma. It wasn't a good time. It was igniting a fire within the band and proving they needed Squizgar. Right. And it's kind of here that I think everyone really gets, and at least myself included. Yeah. A glimpse of just how special Swizgar is. We you get to see his origin, finding his sacred axe, and like all these things that taking the true mantle of a guitar god. Yeah. After he knew he couldn't be happy as immortal, he returned. Well, after you know, he saw what he saw, he returned right. to be a guitar god once more. His rightful throne was once again complete and taken. He was tested and aligned. The the band was faced death. They had their mortality question time and time again. They rose above it all with Squizgar. The clock was stronger than it had ever been, and the time was drawing nearer. Death Clock had continued to amass a power unheard of in any time before. Mordhouse was advancing in technology unheard of, and it was becoming firsthand daily, hand over fist from anything you see and on the forefront of the world. The mechanics of today could not keep up. We had risen and been burned, and we had seen the dead man cometh and lead us to the valley upwards towards glory. I want to ride a horse right now. Right? Like... Things fuck were, something up. This was a new age for Mordhouse. The dead man had truly come to, to set us free. That's true, man. And you know what? I'm fucking pumped. Yeah. I'm getting all jazzed up again, dude. But... On the next episode it's of Death Cast. Oh, it's getting zazzy. It's getting super de- zazzy in Death Cast. On the next episode, like you were saying, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Linda Perswindensen von Struselvich, our local clockologist, on the continued prophecy and how what we've seen affects what we know and what's also to come. Absolutely. And we're going to dive right into the last half of season three and maybe becoming one step closer to understanding the power of the great clock. As always, I've been Clocketeer616, and uh, didn't you have a song you wanted to end on, 47? If you insist. Hell yeah. Are you... God damn it.
Hey guys. Yeah, dude. Thanks for listening to Deathcast. Do we really have to listen to this? i am still got the headphones on. If they're still here, I don't give a fuck. Fucking A, dude. <laughs> Bro, hope you enjoyed it. Come back for part 3.5. Yeah, no, we're gonna release the rest of it soon. We're just, yeah. you know, gonna take a break. Fuck. Twitter's deciding the name of it right now. And if you want to get in on stuff with Deathcast, follow us on Twitter, motherfuckers. Absolutely. Yeah. 